If you were in Australia in the 1980s or the 1990s, you'd be very much aware of who Christopher Skates is because he was featured on the news like basically every night. And to tell his story properly, I will have to tell it in three parts. First, I'll briefly summarise his rise in wealth and the growth of his business and media empire. And then after that, I'll talk about how his empire crumbled. And then for the last chapter, I'll talk about his life overseas, whilst the entire Australian population wanted him brought back to Australia. So, let's begin. Part 1, The Rise. Now, Chris was born in 1948 to radio star Charles Scase in Melbourne. And he was always attracted to the world of big finance and big money, as his career in his younger days was as a stockbroker, and then later after that, a financial journalist. And after a bit of time working in these two fields, him and three of his mates started up a business called Team Securities for roughly about $15,000. Now, it was later renamed to Quintex, and then in 1986 it was renamed to Quintex Entertainment, and this business just seemed to take on a life of its own. Now, initially they focused on retail, but they expanded to include car dealerships, property development, and YouTube subscribers. Okay, I made that last one up, but I think you're getting the hint that I'm trying to drop here. So by 1984, business was booming in all of these fields, and they grew large enough to buy one of the four major TV networks. And this TV network was Channel 7. And if you're not from Australia, just to give an equivalent of what that is, it's sort of like the equivalent of owning CNN or owning Fox. It's kind of a big deal in this country. And his growth just seemed to continue and continue, and nothing just seemed to stop him. After acquiring the media wing, he then expanded into luxury resorts. So he started up a resort company called Mirage Resorts, which would later turn out to be quite an ironic name, being a financial mirage. That, that'll make more sense when you hear the rest of the story. And then he later on swung past my home city of Brisbane and purchased our local AFL team being the Brisbane Bears. And so between the TV network, the resorts, and all of the other businesses, Quintex was worth $1.45 billion in today's inflation adjusted money. And if you're not an Aussie, that's roughly about 1 billion US dollars. And these were the good old days for Skase and his mates. On his 40th birthday, he threw himself a very big party, and this party cost $180,000 in today's money. And he also owned a private jet and a yacht. There's also an unverified story that just shows you how much they're blowing money. So this, again, unverified story stated that planning on having a party in one of the North Queensland resorts until his wife Pixie realized that she forgot to pack her favorite dress. So he chartered his private plane to fly all the way from the island back to Melbourne, which is literally on the other side of the continent, to pick up her dress and then fly back with her dress so she could wear it to the party that night. But as the old saying goes, for both good times and bad times, this too shall pass. So now that brings us to part two of this story, the fall of the Skase Empire. And so what actually brought down the Quintex Empire? Well, it was actually three things that combined together which just created a bit of a perfect storm interest rates are on the rise, that's one factor. The share markets around the world had gone through a massive crash and it was taking a very long time to recover, that was the second factor. And there was a pilot strike which did a lot of damage to his luxury resorts, that was the third factor. And of these three factors combining, Skase was very much over leveraged and whilst he was in this vulnerable position, instead of trying to fortify his holdings and make things more secure or offload some of the more riskier businesses, he decided to continue his rapid expansion even though he was facing all of these conditions, and this would later end up being his undoing. So now let's fast forward to 1989. And Christopher Skase flew over to the United States in an attempt to buy MGM Movie Studios. And yes, that MGM. And MGM were happy to sell to him, and everything was looking good for the deal, apart from the fact that his finance application was rejected. And it was rejected due to the fact that they already had too much debt. And then, straight after this, one of Quintex's other subsidiaries, which happened to be based in the United States as well, filed for bankruptcy. So it looks like that the loan approving officer for this MGM deal, they actually did their job. They saved themselves a massive loss via Christopher's case. So that was kind of the first domino or the first big red flag of what was about to come. And the next one was back in Australia. And again, this is in 1989, where Christopher Skates got into a massive argument with his Quintex board of directors. He wanted his Quintex company to buy one of his private businesses from him and incorporate it into the Quintex umbrella. And this is a $13.5 million purchase. 
And also note, that's not adjusted for inflation. It was $13.5 million back in 1989. And the board did not like this idea of purchasing Skase's private company, and they rejected this, even though Skase was very keen for it. And despite the board not approving this, he actually put through the transaction anyway without the board's approval. And so let's just imagine now that you are on this Quintex board and you specifically told your director not to do this and then he went ahead and did it anyway. Meanwhile, as a managing director, you have a lot of financial legal compliances that you need to meet yourself and you're very much personally legally liable for what's going on. So what is your next move? It is to dob Christopher Scase in to the Australian Securities Commission and that's exactly what they did. And so the combination of these two issues of Skase's board dobbing him into the bankruptcy of a US subsidiary perked up the attention of the Australian Stock Exchange. And they saw these two events as potential red flags for the financial health of Quintex. So they requested that Quintex prove to them that they are financially healthy and they requested that they submit a whole bunch of documents that would be very boring to explain, but basically just proof that they actually are financially healthy. And when Quintex failed to deliver this proof of financial health, the Australian Stock Exchange suspended their shares. This was the first really big domino to fall. So fast forward one month and Quintex had gone into receivership with $1.5 billion in debt. With today's inflation adjusted dollars, that is $6.8 billion. And as the Commonwealth Bank owned the majority of the loans that Quintex were not making the payments on, it was the Commonwealth Bank who had the privilege of appointing a receiver to the Skase business empire. And this appointed receiver sold all of the assets from under Skase. He sold the five resorts to a Japanese company for cents in the dollar and he also sold out Channel 7 from under him. And it can be speculated that some of the journalists who used to work for Skase now had an axe to grind against him because after this sale, Channel 7 in particular were relentless as far as going after Skase. And just to give a modern day equivalent, just so today's audiences can understand for those who weren't around back in the 80s, imagine if Fox News were to turn against the Murdochs and they were to be talking about the Murdochs and how evil they are every night. That is a modern day equivalent of what Channel 7 did with Skase they completely turned on the former owner. And the carnage just seemed to be getting worse and worse than the downfall of his business empire. Quintex had actually borrowed money from many banks, and one of the banks that lent money to him was the Victorian State Bank. And because the Victorian State Bank had lent so much money to him, they had to declare bankruptcy themselves. So yes, you heard that correctly. They bankrupted a state bank. And by 1991, and when all was said and done, the Quintex empire was dead. Skase had a personal liability of $89 million, which is $403 million in today's dollars, and Quintex's liability was $1.5 billion, or $6.8 billion in today's dollars. So that all sounds pretty bad. But do you want to know something that's pretty interesting about this whole case? Whilst Quintex was in this death spiral, Skase, along with his top executive mates, were paying themselves management fees, even though the thing that they were managing was falling apart. And this is also very illegal. And it is for this act that the Australian government actually arrested him and detained him for a night. The next morning, they released him, but upon releasing him, they gave him that speech that they seem to give in all the movies to say that, we don't have enough to get you yet, but don't leave town, son. So he was given this speech, and can you guess what Skase did the morning after he was released from prison? That's right, he left town. In fact, he didn't just leave town, he also left the Southern Hemisphere. He was way gone. And where specifically did he go in the Northern Hemisphere? He went to Spain. And so when news of this got out to the Australian public, there was a lot of anger. I mean, there have been a lot of investors who have been totally cleaned out. And there were also tradesmen that had worked for him. In fact, I actually personally know one of the builders that worked for him. And at a time when Case left, he was left $20,000 out of pocket, which is about $90,000 in today's money. So I'm just a normal, ordinary Australian. And even I know people who are personally directed affected by this guy. And so this caused a lot of anger in the Australian population when they saw that he's living it up in Spain. Despite all this anger and all of the this obvious plain sight stuff that was going on in 1991, it took the Australian government until 1994 to actually be able to place criminal charges against him. And part of the reason why they took so long is that they wanted to do it properly and they wanted to do it with the best information that they could access. And they were actually able to recruit the help of one of Skase's former executives, who was a man by the name of Lawrence Vanderplatt, and he provided a lot of critical information for this investigation. So all up, Skase was facing 60 criminal charges. And so, both the Australian government and the Australian public wanted him extradited from Spain. And this is where the story takes a bit of an interesting turn. And that now brings us to part three of the Skase story. 
Christopher Skase's cigar smoking days had caught up with him and he'd now developed a case of terminal emphysema. And with this, one day Skase decided to take a holiday in Switzerland. And correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't Switzerland the country that people used to go to back in the day if you wanted to hide money from every other government on the planet? I'm sure it's just a coincidence for why he was choosing the holiday there. But anyway, on this flight, he suffered an enumerate thorax, which in English is basically your lungs blowing out. And this, to cut a long story short, prevented him from being able to fly in an aeroplane ever again. And of course, the Australian government and the Australian population were very skeptical about this when it happened, because he had a very long history of faking back injuries to get out of trouble in earlier days. So, Skase's doctor said it was too dangerous for his lungs to be able to fly again, and the Australian government sent in some lung specialists, and they said it was actually safe for him to fly. So they did what any two parties would do to reasonably resolve a dispute, and that is to consult a lung specialist from a neutral country that is not involved. And so, they consulted with a Swiss pulmonary specialist that looked over Christopher Skase's lungs, and he actually sided with the Spanish doctors, stating that it was too dangerous for him to ever fly ever again. And this situation was inflamed even further when there happened to be another Australian family on a holiday, and they happened to capture footage of Skase just walking around normally on a Spanish beach without any obvious sign of a health effect. And so when this one was given to the Australian media, it was put on the news on every channel that night and it sent the Australian population into an anger frenzy. Ah! So public opinion was very much against him at this point. And I do put in a big effort to try and be balanced and neutral here. So I do need to point something out about this footage of him walking around healthily. A big thing about lung conditions is changing atmospheres. And so whilst your lungs may be completely healthy in a stable atmosphere, a changing atmosphere can actually aggravate and cause an underlying lung condition to severely depreciate. So things like, say, hopping in an aeroplane or even scuba diving. And so with that knowledge, the, the film of him just walking around normally in a Spanish beach wasn't quite the smoking gun that everyone thought it was. And to me, it seems very plausible that he actually is telling the truth about his lung condition. But that was probably the only thing he was telling the truth about, as it is extremely likely that he did embezzle a lot of his investors' money. And this is kind of backed up by the fact that he was living in a Spanish mansion and living a lifestyle that a local Spanish wage would just not pay for. But despite the fact that he's living in a Spanish paradise, this wasn't a utopia for the Skase family. And this is because him and his family were constantly receiving death threats from very angry Australians. And this situation was not helped by the fact that Channel 7, his former TV network, was just showing him on the news every night living in this Spanish house. And just put yourself in the shoes of these Australians for a moment. Imagine that you're an investor and you just lost your entire investment. Or imagine that you're a trader or a builder and you'd worked for three months you never got paid for it, and what's even worse than that, you had to pay for materials out of your own pocket, which you never got reimbursed for. So imagine that you just lost all of this money and you're struggling to pay your bills, and then you see the cause for you not having any money, living a great life in Spain. So of course these people were angry. And although Christopher's case had done the crime, unfortunately his family were the victims of his behavior. And they have stated that whilst they're living in Spain, they were just living in constant fear that some Australian would take justice into their own hands and try and get revenge against him and the family. And for the Skase family, it wasn't just the old Australian wacko that they had to fear. Highly respected TV personality Andrew Denton organized for a public subscription to hire a bounty hunter to go over to Spain, kidnap Skase, and bring him back to Australia to face his charges. But this idea was later cancelled due to legal advice and the fact that they were warned that it would cause an international incident amongst the Australians and the Spaniards. Imagine that either Tucker Carlson or Don Lemon or Koshi were to organise for the public to pay money into a subscription so they could kidnap someone from overseas and bring them back to their country. I mean, this is crazy, right? Right? I'm, I'm losing my voice. And since Australia really had it in for Chris, Christopher Skase and his family denounced their Australian citizenship and declared themselves citizens of Dominica instead. But Dominica has an extradition treaty with Australia anyway, so in the big scheme of things that didn't really change that much. And eventually the Spaniards put him in one of their prisons, where it was discovered that he actually had stomach cancer along with his emphysema. Now he later died on the 5th of August 2001. But do you want to know the really crazy thing about this whole Skase chase? Is that in the late 80s, there weren't near as many laws as what there are today in regards to financial compliance. And hypothetically, if he ever did come back to Australia to face the music, he likely would have only faced six months in prison and a $20,000 fine. 
fine, which is $90,000 today. Now, this is with those laws that existed in the late 80s when he actually committed these crimes. And so if he didn't actually die of stomach cancer and if he actually did make his way back to Australia, he would have been freed after paying $90,000 as he would have already had time served from that Spanish prison. And this is according to a man by the name of Henry Gosh. So the Australian public and the Australian government, we did waste a ton of money in trying to bring Christopher Scase back to Australia to face justice. Now that we know that the justice would have been basically non-existent if he did face it. But in many of these cases, it's more about the principle than it is about the financial amount. And you want to make an example of him just to deter any future Christopher Scases that are considering doing what he did. Anyway, after Scases' death, his family did slowly and very quietly end up making their way back to Australia. So the last one to return was Christopher Scases' wife, Pixie. She returned to Melbourne in 2009 at the age of 67. That's basically an overall summary of the whole Christopher Scase story and the whole chase for case. 